All right, I am showing noon Eastern time, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome again to a joint webinar from the NIOSH Total Worker Health Program and the Center for Workers' Compensation Studies titled Cannabis and Workers' Compensation, Now What? My name is Jamie Osborne, and it's my pleasure to serve as one of the moderators for today's webinar, along with Steve Wurzelbacher. On behalf of the NIOSH Total Worker Health Program and the Center for Workers' Compensation Studies, we are delighted to have you with us today. After a brief introduction from Dr. John Howard, NIOSH Director, we'll first hear from Jennifer Wolf, the Executive Director of the International Association of Industrial Accident Boards and Commissions, or IAIABC. As the Executive Director of the IAIABC, Jennifer builds community, creates value, and motivates change. The actions and innovations of IAIABC members work to reduce harm and aid recovery for those impacted by an occupational injury, illness, or fatality. In her role, Ms. Wolf connects with industry professionals from around the globe to identify emerging issues, develop resources, and reinforce the social purpose of workers' compensation programs. You can hear Ms. Wolf's perspective on workers' compensation during the IAIABC's monthly podcast. Even though Jennifer accidentally fell into workers' compensation, she appreciates the important role it plays in our health, safety, and security at work. Ms. Wolf has authored numerous articles on workers' compensation management and regulatory topics, most recently on changing employment relationships, the platform economy, and emerging healthcare trends in workers' compensation. Ms. Wolf has frequently presented on the history, foundations, and structure of workers' compensation in the United States. Ms. Wolf manages five staff and works closely with the IAIABC Board of Directors and other association leaders. Jennifer graduated from the University of Kansas with a BS in chemistry. Her degree is put to good use with baking experiments in her free time. Next, we'll hear from Raji H. Chatteravian, Director of Medical Regulation and Informatics with the National Council on Compensation Insurance, or NCCI. Raji Chatteravian currently leads a team of actuaries responsible for pricing proposed and enacted changes to laws and regulations governing medical benefits and workers' compensation in all NCCI states. With over 25 years in the workers' compensation field, he is NCCI's primary actuarial expert on matters relating to medical data and workers' compensation health informatics. Prior to 2012, Chatteravian was responsible for several state rate filings, including Montana, New Mexico, and Oregon. Chatteravian is the principal author of How is Medical Inflation Measured and Why Should I Care? and Killer Pain Relief, Opioids and Workers' Compensation. He is also the principal author of Gen RX, The Next Generation of Medicine, which was presented at NCCI's Virtual Annual Issues Symposium 2020. Most recently, he authored articles on COVID-19's impact on medical treatment and workers' compensation. Chatteravian received a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics from the University of Southern California in Los Angeles, and he received the 2020 IAIABC Award of Merit. And finally, we will hear from John Rooser, President and CEO of the Workers' Compensation Research Institute, or WCRI. John W. Rooser, PhD, has 35 years of professional experience in conducting and managing economic research projects in labor and health economics, and in managing and interpreting economic surveys pertaining to employee pay, benefits, and working conditions. He is currently President and CEO of the Workers' Compensation Research Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts, an independent, not-for-profit research organization. Dr. Rooser is responsible for executive leadership and strategic planning for the Institute, as well as oversight of the Institute's economic and statistical research program. Dr. Rooser previously held three executive positions in the federal statistical system, serving as Associate Commissioner for Productivity and Technology and Assistant Commissioner for Safety, Health, and Working Conditions, both at the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics and Associate Director for Regional Economics at the U.S. Department of Commerce Bureau of Economic Analysis. In these three positions, he managed statistical programs that produce data on productivity, worker safety and health, and regional income, price, and product accounts. Previously, Dr. Rooser was a researcher and chief of the BLS office that conducted research on and improved measures of employee pay, benefits, and working conditions in the U.S. Dr. Rooster has written many academic peer-reviewed and non-technical articles and book chapters on employee compensation and occupational safety and health. 
He holds a PhD and MA in economics from the University of Chicago and a BA in economics from Princeton University. Next slide, please. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Howard. John Howard is the director of the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health and the administrator of the World Trade Center Health Program in the US Department of Health and Human Services. Dr. Howard was first appointed NIOSH director in 2002 during the George W. Bush administration and served in that position until 2008. In 2009, Dr. Howard worked as a consultant with the US Afghanistan Health Initiative. In September of 2009, Dr. Howard was again appointed NIOSH director and was reappointed for a third six-year term in 2015. Prior to his appointments as NIOSH Director and World Trade Center Health Program Administrator, Dr. Howard served as Chief of the Division of Occupational Safety and Health in the State of California's Labor and Workforce Development Agency from 1991 through 2002. Dr. Howard earned a Doctor of Medicine from Loyola University of Chicago, a Master of Public Health from the Harvard University School of Public Health, a Doctor of Law from the University of California at Los Angeles, as well as a Master of Law in Administrative Law and Economic Regulation, and a Master of Business Administration in Healthcare Management, both degrees from the George Washington University in Washington, DC. Dr. Howard is board certified in internal medicine and occupational medicine. He is admitted to the practice of medicine and law in the state of California and in the District of Columbia, and he is a member of the US Supreme Court Bar. He has written numerous articles on occupational health policy and law. Over to you, Dr. Howard. Thank you, Jamie, and welcome everyone. Cannabis sativa is one of the oldest and most widely used plants in the world. Native to Asia, the different cultivars of cannabis sativa have been used for a wide variety of industrial, medical, and non-medical uses for thousands of years. Despite its long history, the use of cannabis-derived products remains a source of controversy across the fields of medicine, law, and occupational safety and health. More favorable public attitudes about cannabis in the United States have resulted in greater access to cannabis through legalization by states and have led to more consumption. In 2018, for example, nearly 18% of workers employed full-time and nearly 21% of workers employed part-time used cannabis. Although large-scale surveys about worker consumption are at a first step, detailed occupational surveillance data are needed. Surveillance studies about the specific industries and occupations where worker cannabis consumption is most prevalent, the frequency and timing of consumption relative to work shifts, and the relationship of consumption to productivity and workplace safety would provide all of us a more detailed profile of worker cannabis consumption. As medicalization and legalization of cannabis proceed apace, with increased cannabis consumption among working adults, so does the need for employers, workers, occupational safety and health practitioners, workers' compensation insurers, and researchers to address the impacts that cannabis consumption is having on existing workplace safety and health policies, programs, and practices. As more states adopt cannabis access laws, and as Congress continues to consider the merits of federal legalization, the implications for existing workplace policy programs and practices become more salient. Past workplace practices were grounded in a time when cannabis consumption was always viewed as problematic, considered a moral failing and universally illegal. Now, as cannabis is legally available to workers in many states, attention needs to be focused on the implications and the challenges surrounding cannabis and work. Today, we explore an important dimension of cannabis use, the role of cannabis in the workers' compensation insurance system. I wanna thank each of our expert presenters for sharing their knowledge with us today. And I 
Also want to thank the NIOSH Center for Workers' Compensation Studies and the NIOSH Office of Total Worker Health for presenting this valuable learning opportunity for us today. Back to you, Jamie. Thanks so much, Dr. Howard. And next I am pleased to introduce Jennifer Wolf. Thank you, Jamie, and thank you, Dr. Howard. I also just want to say thank you to NIOSH for inviting the IAIABC to participate on this program. I am humbled to be a part of this distinguished panel. Cannabis and its use within the workers' compensation system has been an issue that the IAIABC has followed for the last seven or eight years. As Dr. Howard mentions, attitudes toward cannabis use have been changing in the United States. And as a result, the legal and regulatory environment across the US has continued to shift. My remarks today are going to focus on the public policy related issues in terms of cannabis as a therapeutic in workers' compensation. A little bit later in the program, John is going to address the occupational safety and compensability issues. What makes cannabis a fascinating subject of study, at least from my perspective, and beyond the opportunities to tell really bad jokes, is that cannabis expansion and access has been driven at, by state activity at the state level. This has resulted in a complex and constantly changing policy landscape. The trend is clearly toward expansion and enhanced access to cannabis. Next slide. The landscape of cannabis has really changed dramatically in just a few years. In 2021, there are 36 states which have cannabis programs broadly. 16 states, and those are indicated in the deepest shade of green on your map, allow both recreational and medicinal use of cannabis. Additionally, there are 20 states, that's sort of the, um, the middle shade of green, have medicinal cannabis program. And this number of states that have broadened access to cannabis grows each and every year. For example, in November 2020, five states had ballot propositions which expanded marijuana use. You will note on the map that there are many states that have the, are in the lightest shade of green. These are states that do not have broad cannabis programs, but they do have legislation which allows CBD products with very low THC content or have very narrow specific uh, access to cannabis. There are now only three states, Idaho, Kansas, and Nebraska, that do not allow cannabis in any form. What's interesting about state cannabis programs is, they, is that they've often come about through ballot propositions, so by direct um, involvement of the voters. These ballot propositions either direct state legislatures to create cannabis programs or add constitutional amendments to the state. Because these initiatives are being accomplished by different means across different state environments, there are, is no cannabis program that looks the same. There is no standard policy framework for how cannabis is prescribed, dispensed, taxed, or used. Additionally, there is continuing to be a disconnect between federal and state policy, which has created um, both operational and policy challenges at the state level. Cannabis businesses, for example, cannot use the regular banking system. It's a cash only business. And from a worker's compensation perspective, this creates some practical challenges that we'll talk a little bit about later. Next slide. The trend toward expanded access means that more and more people live in states with either a medicinal or recreational program. That should ask us, well, how many people are we talking about? Using U.S. Census Bureau data, this slide shows that 70% of the U.S. population lives in a state that either has a recreational or medicinal program. 
It's interesting to note that a similar percentage of the U.S. labor force also lives in states that have access to either recreational or medicinal programs. There are really three strategies states have taken. The first is that there is a specific prohibition against the use of cannabis in treating workers' compensation injuries. So the states that you see here in the deepest red do not have a broad cannabis program. So workers' compensation would not consider cannabis. There are also states in the lighter shade of red that do have cannabis programs. So for example, uh, Washington and Montana. In these states, the workers' compensation law or rules have specifically excluded cannabis in the treatment of work injuries. In contrast, there are other states, some of, um, these are the ones indicated in green, that have allowed cannabis in workers' compensation. And I wanna make sure that we understand there's a distinction between allowing cannabis in treating work injuries and reimbursing um, for the medicinal use of cannabis by the insurer, claim administrator, or self-insured employer. Some courts have allowed the use of cannabis, but have not required the insurer to reimburse for the cannabis. Oftentimes we see that the use of cannabis in a workers' compensation case has come from a very specific court decision. And from a public policy perspective, the fact that court decisions are driving enhanced use and access to cannabis and workers' compensation might give us pause for a couple of reasons. A single case is off, the, the fact that a single case is often influencing policy for an entire state population. And the, we, what we also see happening is that courts and then their appeals courts can often overrule or re-decide a case based on their interpretation of the facts and the existing law. All of this creates volatility and uncertainty, both of which are undesirable in the workers' compensation system. In many states, those are the states that you'll see in light gray, the workers' compensation system is silent on the use of cannabis in the context specifically of workers' compensation. Cannabis is not specifically allowed or not specifically disallowed and a treatment could be brought up allowed or disallowed as a part of the adjudication process. The question of whether cannabis is allowed or reimbursable is very complex. And an, an example of, this comp of these complications is that 22 states do not require reimbursement of marijuana by private insurers. And states have interpreted these provisions in different ways from a workers' compensation perspective. And now I'm going to uh, turn the microphone over to Raji, who's going to take us through a couple of the court cases we've seen. Thank you, Jennifer. And uh, maybe we can look at the next slide there. Um, so our legal department at NCCI regularly reviews major court decisions related to workers' compensation and provides summaries on our website. As you can see, the decisions are tagged with a major topic of interest for workers' compensation. And in this case, you can see that cannabis or marijuana, if you like, is one topic that has seen much activity as Jennifer just uh, shared. Uh, I invite you to look up some of these on our website, but I did want to go over a couple of cases very briefly to illustrate this wide variation in the laws and their interpretation. Uh, as Jennifer uh, very, uh, very kindly put it and very, very wisely put it, and when it comes to the use of marijuana to treat injured workers in our systems. Next slide, please. So uh, the first case, that, uh, uh, that illustrates some uh, of uh, these factors is the 2020 Daniel Wright decision decided by the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court. And there the court ruled that a workers' compensation insurer 
cannot be required to reimburse a claimant for medical marijuana expenses as a necessary and reasonable medical treatment. In its decision, the court relied uh, particularly on a provision in the Massachusetts Medical Marijuana Act, which basically said nothing in the state medical marijuana law requires health insurance providers to reimburse any person for medical marijuana expenses. The court concluded that the law's reimbursement limitation on health insurance providers also applies to workers' comp insurers. If you recall from uh, the map that, uh, that Jennifer shared, there's nothing specific about the medical marijuana as regards workers' comp in, in the statutes. But the interpretation of the court was rather uh, that as it applies to uh, health insurance, so does it for workers' compensation, because the court found that uh, uh, in effect, uh, workers' comp insurers are plainly providing health insurance benefits. The court also reasoned that the reimbursement limitations avoids exposing insurers to potential prosecution under federal law and the risk of federal prosecution exists, regardless of whether a medical marijuana patient seeks reimbursement from the health insurance provider or from a workers' comp insurer. So clearly uh, uh, an interpretation that, that took some, some uh, time. Um, with this ruling, the court also affirmed on different grounds at the, the lower court's decision by the Department of Industrial Accidents, which found that marijuana's status as a federally illicit substance preempted any state level authority to order workers' comp insurer to pay for the claimant's medical marijuana expenses. So that was uh, the Massachusetts case. Now, moving on to the second case, that's uh, the 2019 appeal of Andrew Penaggio that was decided by the New Hampshire Supreme Court. Um, the New Hampshire Supreme Court held that the State Compensation Appeals Board erred when it determined that the workers' comp insurance carriers prohibited by state and federal law from reimbursing an injured worker for the cost of medical marijuana treatment. In its decision, the court found that state's medical marijuana law does not prohibit reimbursement under workers' compensation. So clearly a different perspective there uh, from the court. And finally, the court remanded the case to the board to provide further legal support as to the determination that federal law would be violated if the insurance carries or the reimburse for the payment. So clearly, uh, you know, variation in the interpretation in the actual laws and their interpretation. Back to you, Jennifer. Thank you, Raji, for sharing some of those court decisions. As we pointed out, the fact that cannabis enhanced access and its use in workers' compensation cases is being driven by case law is something to closely monitor and will continue to influence the workers' compensation system in the years to come. Just really quickly, I want to also note that there are right, the workers' compensation system is a highly regulated um, insurance system. And there are some additional barriers which could make cannabis more difficult to integrate into the treatment of work injuries. From an administrative perspective, cannabis is generally not obtained in the same way as other therapeutics or prescription drugs. There is no standardized way for cannabis to be prescribed, billed, and paid for. That certainly will have to be overcome in the future. Additionally, as long as cannabis is illegal at the federal level, claim administrators are not able to pay directly for cannabis. Instead, they can only reimburse the injured worker for medicinal cannabis. And there's only one state, New Mexico, which has developed a fee schedule for cannabis reimbursement. I also want to say that there are many state work comp systems that have treatment guidelines and formularies, which are created using medical evidence uh, related to the most desirable treatments and pharmaceuticals for workers' compensation industries. 
And because there is not as much research on the efficacy of cannabis in treating different workers' compensation conditions, um, they have not been incorporated heretofore in treatment guidelines and a formulary. And I really think that in the future, the workers' compensation system is going to look toward medical research to try to understand better how cannabis can be used effectively and if it can be used safely in treating workers' compensation injuries. And Raji is going to tell us a lot more about medical research and medical e efficacy. Thanks so much, Raji. Very good. Thank you, uh, Jennifer. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, so, you know, one thing that, uh, that I share with my colleagues here uh, in our world of workers' comp is that it's full of terms and acronyms that are very specific to our industry. So where we are here, we're visiting today a world that I found to have its own vocabulary. So I thought it would be useful perhaps to share with you today some of the terms, and forgive me if you're already familiar with those. But uh, next, after that, we're going to take a tour of some of the evidence we have seen in the literature about the uses of cannabis for medical purposes. And in Workers' Comp, we talk about pain almost every day. It's, it's a very common place, so uh, we'll talk about that. And then we will uh, look at other conditions that are becoming perhaps more commonly treated in the world of the injured worker. And I'll finally have some thoughts on a topic that's of interest to both the comp world and elsewhere, namely opioids. Moving along then to the next chart, let's start with the definitions uh, here. And I, I'm just really uh, trying to, to share a few of these that I think may be pertinent when one reads the literature. So the system that cannabis interacts with in humans is called the human endocannabinoid system. And I tried to say that three times, I just could not, but then I don't have to. Uh, so surprisingly, this, this has not, was not discovered until the 1990s. Um, now cannabis, or what uh, uh, are sometimes referred to as cannabinoids, include a couple of compounds the tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC for short, and cannabidiol, or CBD. Both compounds interact with the ECS system, right? I'm going to be very short with that, uh, to produce therapeutic effects. Effectively, the term medical marijuana does not have a specific chemical composition or potency which creates a host of issues, as, uh, as Jennifer indicated, that we will highlight as we go along. All right, moving right along to the next slide now. A couple more things about marijuana. It is, as Jennifer said, uh, classified as a Schedule One drug today, which makes it difficult to obtain necessary licenses to conduct research. There's only a single strain that's used, and that's not representative of what's out there in the legal marketplace. So that makes research quite uh, uh, difficult. Next, uh, next slide, please. Key to the composition of the therapeutic factor is the proportion between the THC and CBD. So variability in the potency depends on the strain and on the method of consumption whether it's smoking, ingestion, or vaporization, or what have you. Many studies on the effectiveness did not take these factors into account, and thus the shedding some uncertainty on the resulting conclusions. Nevertheless, it's clear that some combinations have, found, have been found to be efficacious to treat certain uh, uh, conditions, particularly certain types of pain. So let's talk about the uh, classification of pain next. And the next slide, please. And the initiation, maintenance, and perception of pain is influenced by biological, psychosocial, and movement system factors. Now, biological pain mechanisms can be categorized into three classes. The nociceptive or peripheral class, 
And this is one where that's often caused by inflammation or injury, like osteoarthritis, cancer pain, or more commonly in workers' comp, say an ankle sprain. Uh, this is thought to respond positively to CBD, but not to THC. And quite often, this is treated with opioids in the workers' comp world. The next thing that the next class is the neuropathic uh, uh, class of pain, and that one's often caused by nerve damage. So think of carpal tunnel or sciatica. Um, the thought here is that it would respond positively to THC, but not to CBD. And again, uh, the neuropathic pain is often treated by opioids in the workers' comp world. The third and final class of uh, pain that I'm going to talk about is the centralized or nociplastic class. And this one's often caused by the central nervous system, a disturbance in the central pain, like low back pain or fibromyalgia. This is thought, again, to respond positively to THC, but not to CBD, but it is not typically treated with opioids. Next slide, please. The National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, NASEM for short, uh, has completed a thorough review of literature and provides a list of conditions for which cannabis has been shown to possibly be efficacious. Chronic pain, cancer-induced nausea and vomiting, et cetera. You see the list there. So let's turn to the next slide and talk briefly about chronic pain, as this condition is often encountered in workers' compensation. There have been several studies showing uh, some use of THC to be effective in treating chronic pain. While this is clearly relevant to the many injured workers with neuropathic pain from spine injuries, questions regarding dose, the long-term efficacy, and the relative safety remain unanswered. And as John will soon be talking about, the issues of return to work and potential impairment can be critical for injured workers using cannabis. NCCI data on the next slide, please. NCCI data shows that 60% of all claims receiving medical services after 90 days are chronic pain claims, and 70% of those currently undergo treatment using opioids. We'll share with you a little more about opioid use trends in a minute. On slide 24 now. One key hurdle to the use of cannabis in treating chronic pain for injured workers is the limited, if any, guidance from treatment guidelines, as Jennifer uh, pointed out, and potential problems with the overuse of cannabis, of course. Some data suggests that the use of cannabis as an analgesic in selected individuals with chronic pain may be medically appropriate. However, the psychotropic and other side effects must be considered in planning return to work. How about other uses? Let's see. Um, there is one observational study that links the use of marijuana to better outcomes after a traumatic brain injury. Now, NCCI data shows that 60% of injured workers who suffered a head injury resulting in a lost time claim have a traumatic brain injury. That's pretty significant. The evidence regarding the use of cannabinoids to treat TBI during recovery, however, remains rather unknown. Other issues, comorbidities. Some comorbidities that occur fairly often in workers' compensation are the accompanied anxiety and depression subsequent to a traumatic injury. In fact, NCCI data shows that one out of 42 injured workers with chronic pain have received mental health services in 2018. As per the NASEM review, there is, quote, limited evidence to suggest a benefit from cannabis in the management of anxiety symptoms, and practically no scientific evidence to suggest any benefit in the management of depressive symptoms. Typical treatments include some benzodiazepines, or benzos for short, such as Xanax and Valium. And 
these can have some devastating effects when used in conjunction with oil. Finally, while cannabis is approved for the use to treat PTSD in some jurisdictions, there seems to be a lack of evidence for its efficacy. We have seen several states enact legislation about the compensability of PTSD in recent years in workers' comp, and that makes this type of research important to inform the decision making. Next slide, please. We and researchers around the country are often asked the question, to what extent would legalization of cannabis help contain the use of opioids in workers' comp? And while opioid use had been decreasing over the last several years, as you can see from the chart there, that decreasing trend may have come to a halt in this past year of COVID-19. So the question is perhaps even more pertinent today than ever in the past as we all have witnessed the tragic consequences of opioid misuse and addiction. On slide 29, we share with you the results of some studies uh, regarding opioids. And some, like the Bradford studies, showed lower prescribed quantities of opioids in states where cannabis could be legally used. But a lot of the studies were limited to specific populations not typical of the workers' compensation injured worker characteristics. A more recent study in 2019 by Luis Segura and others found little evidence of an association between medical marijuana law enactment and non-medical prescription opioid use or prescription opioid use disorder among prescription opioid users. So clearly a lot of variation in the results uh, of these studies. What is certain is that the risks and benefits of cannabis use to individual patients require further investigation today as the laws and availability of cannabis take hold. Before I hand off to John, I just wanted to point out the various studies that I have used in preparing for these remarks today for our reference and for yours. And uh, on the next slide, I just... Uh, would like to invite you to join us on our website with a lot more details. John, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Raji. Um, so I'm gonna talk briefly about three topics related to marijuana and the workplace. The first is what evidence there is regarding marijuana use and workplace safety. Then I'll turn to a related topic, which is how uh, marijuana consumption might impair a person and how uh, impairment is detected. And finally, what are the workers' compensation rules regarding compensation when marijuana is detected? Next slide, please. So it would seem obvious that marijuana consumption would result in an increase in workplace injuries and other adverse workplace outcomes. Indeed, if you go to the website of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, uh, you'll see the following quote that's appearing on your on the slide, which is that studies have suggested specific links between marijuana use and adverse consequences in the workplace, such as increased risk for injury or accidents. Next slide. But wait, <laughs> um, in fact, however, um, there are some systematic reviews of the very limited literature that are much more cautious about this. Um, and I mentioned the fact that there's limited literature because as, uh, as uh, Jennifer and Raji have mentioned, um, it is difficult to do research on marijuana because of the limited availability of, of marijuana to do such research. Uh, so one study, a systematic review by Biasuti, Leffers and Callaghan, uh, concluded that the current body of evidence does not provide sufficient evidence to support the position that cannabis users are at increased risk of occupational injury. Uh, the, the studies that they review generally do show some association between cannabis use and increase of occupational injury, but uh, they, they caution that uh, this may not support a causal relationship. Similarly, 
the Canadian Institute for Work and Health said there is a striking, uh, it is striking how little high quality evidence there is on the impacts of marijuana in the workplace and how inconsistent the existing data are. So next slide, please. So why are the results so inconclusive? First of all, there are what are called confounding factors that tend to affect both the use of marijuana and the likelihood of an accident. So for example, if a particular worker has a, has a higher uh, taste for risk, they may be more likely to consume marijuana and they may also have a higher likelihood of having an accident. That doesn't mean that the consumption of marijuana resulted in an accident, but simply that there is a relationship between the two because of the risk-taking behavior of individuals. Also, and sort of related, many of the studies are based on post-incident investigation. So they look at an accident, uh, and they look at the results of a drug test post-accident, and they notice that there's a strong correlation between a testing positive for THC and uh, the accidents. But the key question is, was the worker impaired at the time of the accident? Next slide, please. So I'll talk now a little bit about um, impairment caused by marijuana. Next slide, please. So um, there is a, some guidelines on marijuana in the workplace that were jointly issued by the American Association of Occupational Health Nurses and the American College of Occupational and Environmental Medicine. Uh, the study is a little bit dated, but, but it talks about the relationship between positive drug testing results and impairment. First off, it notes that urine levels of THC do not correlate with impairment. THC stays in the body for a long time, and um, there are urine tests can show THC when, in fact, there is no impairment. Blood levels of THC do tend to correlate more directly. However, um, impairment still should be evaluated with a neurocognitive exam, uh, the guidelines suggest. So impairment periods are shown to depend on a variety of factors, as Raji mentioned, including the dose, uh, the, the method of administration, that is smoking versus ingestion, and whether or not the user is an occasional user or a long-time user. The guidelines suggest that for smoking, and that's the, the bullet that I'm mentioning here, uh, in, in when I mentioned in general, for smoking, impairment tends to wear off uh, in two to four hours. For ingestion, you know, eating those brownies, um, the impairment can last longer. However, uh, the literature is not so clear about any longer impairment issues associated with the consumption of marijuana. Next slide. So, um, the, the, the guidelines also talk about the relationship between THC blood levels and likely impairment. And um, one thing I got to note is that the article is from 2015, and one of the authors uh, cautioned me that the, um, some of the information has been evolving over time. Uh, again, a theme that you hear from both, uh, 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 both Jennifer and Raji, that, that there's been a, a shifting of the landscape here. But um, there are some basic fundamentals here. One is that there are THC blood levels below which impairment cannot be established. So low levels of THC in the blood probably don't suggest impairment. And there are levels of THC in the blood where impairment is likely. Another point that is raised by the guidelines is that long-term users are likely impaired at higher levels of THC than are occasional users. Next slide. So what about the use of marijuana and compensability? Next slide. Just like everything in workers' compensation, uh, the, the, the laws and rules around the presence of THC in the body and how it affects compensability varies by state. The traditional and still majority approach among the states is that intoxication constitutes an affirmative employer defense. So the employer has to show that the worker was intoxicated when they were injured. In the majority of states, the employer must show that the intoxication was the proximate cause of the injury. It doesn't have to be the only cause, but it has to be the proximate cause. In a minority of the states that still use this approach, the uh, cause the, that intoxication has to be the sole cause of the injury. 
And finally, in, a, in some jurisdictions, such as the District of Columbia, it is presumed that the injury was not occasioned by intoxication. So there's been some changing over time, however, next slide. And some sh states have shifted away from the affirmative employer defense, and it shifts the burden of proof onto the worker. So states are creating rebuttable presumptions that a worker found to have a drug present in their body was intoxicated at the time of the injury. And um, the states will differ in terms of how much uh, of THC has to be in the body um, to establish that presumption. In 17 states, any presence of an illegal drug like marijuana gives rise to the presumption both of intoxication and that the drug was caused by the injury, that, that the drug caused the injury. A few states have established threshold levels for marijuana and other intoxicants. So uh, a, a worker who is found to have low levels below the threshold um, would not be presumed to be intoxicated. Um, a common feature of all these laws, however, is that uh, the, the worker is obliged to take uh, a drug test in the, uh, in the event of an accident. And if they refuse, intoxication is presumed. That's pretty much the same as is the case with driving under the influence of alcohol. Next slide. So I've actually raised more questions than I've answered. Um, it's clear that there is more research that is needed. And I know that a lot of this research is on the NIOSH agenda. One is we need to have much better information about uh, the relationship between marijuana consumption and workplace injuries. We need to be able to establish sort of what thresholds of marijuana consumption would actually result in workplace injuries. There are still issues around how to measure impairment and finally, we need to better establish the relationship between THC blood levels and impairment. So I thank you very much for listening. And I think we're going to go next to a Q&A. All right. Well, this is Steve Wurzelbacher from the NIOSH Center for Workers' Compensation Studies. And I, I just first wanted to thank all the speakers today. Um, really gave just a very good overview of a complex and, and evolving area. Um, we all know that really this is changing every day, um, but we appreciate uh, their willingness to come today and, and talk about these different issues. I also wanted to uh, just express my um, gratitude for everyone's patience. We had a bit of tech difficulties to begin. I think everybody has a plan until the internet goes down. So I think we can all relate to that. So I wanted to um, encourage you to still go ahead and put in questions in the, in the Q&A box. We have several here that we were going to go through. Um, but we do have um, up until one o'clock here to answer these questions. And if you do um, actually have a particular person that you want to answer the question, please let me know. Otherwise, we will um, just send it to the general group. All right. Well, to start, a first question we have is, when you describe cannabis, can you differentiate between flower concentrates, e.g. hash and dabs, edibles and topicals? Um, would any of the uh, panel like to volunteer to answer that question? Well, I, I can I can take a stab at it, and that, I think that's one of the challenging issues surrounding cannabis is because cannabis, particularly when we think about it as the you know as a therapeutic as a as used medicinally, it's not prescribed in the it's not prescribed per se by a medical doctor. Generally, you are you get a you know, a medicinal registration card for, for a qualifying condition. And then you, the patient, go into the dispensary and are able to select the product that you want um, and the, the delivery mechanism that best meets your needs. And each of those delivery mechanisms, you know, has different effects on each individual patient. And so I think that's one of the complications when we look at cannabis and how it can be applied from a medical context, um, because there is there are all sorts of different strains and there are all sorts of different delivery mechanisms. Um, and, and that certainly creates challenges and there's no consistency across that. All right. Th thanks, Jennifer. Does anybody else on the panel want to comment before going to the next question? 
All right. Well, we have plenty of questions coming in here. So the next one is, can you comment on the use of THC CBD products on the reduction of opioid dependence? Again, uh, any volunteers from the panel for that particular question? I can take a stab at this. And as I mentioned, there, there is, there's a host of studies and the, the, the differences are as to uh, what part of the THC CBD combination uh, is efficacious with regards to what type of uh, treatment that is being in a medical condition. The, that beyond that, uh, in terms of the dependence uh, on opioids uh, and uh, uh, and workers' compensation, we just don't have enough experience in workers' comp with regards to uh, the use of medicinal uh, cannabis. Uh, so at this point, it, it's very hard to conduct studies because the data is just not there. All right, any other comments from the panel? So th there's a follow-up question right after that that relates to, um, you know, ha have we seen actual changes in the utilization of other services like um, pain management, uh, physical therapy, and Cairo? Um, how about has the amount of days of work or how fast a case closes with marijuana? Any kind of research on those topic areas? Uh, Raji, I don't know if you want to continue <laughs> to talk about those. Yeah, uh, uh, as I mentioned, we we do not have the full claims files in our data stream, so we don't see uh, much of the use of medical marijuana in our data. Uh, so uh, we we're not able to identify those claims and, and conduct such uh, uh, such research. In addition, to my knowledge, uh, the use of medical marijuana in workers' compensation is still very, very limited, and any studies would be, I, th I think, would just not have enough volume to, to be meaningful, to draw meaningful conclusions just yet. I might jump in and concur with, uh, with Raji that the data we see in, at WCRI also would not allow us to identify uh, the dispensing of marijuana for, for use uh, in the treatment of an injury. So you can't make those direct connections. Um, I would note that the study designs that are often used in the literature, I, Raji mentioned some of them, like the Bradford studies, utilize uh, interstate variation in the laws themselves as a way of inferring uh, the different environments. And so you have, as, as uh, Raji and Jennifer have shown, you have different legal environments in the different states that, um, that provide different opportunities for, um, for use of uh, medical marijuana, and frankly, even self-medication, if you will. Um, and and th they've been used to infer changes in, and particularly, for example, in the Bradford studies, changes in the amount of, of other drugs that are used for various uh, conditions. All right. Uh, tons of questions are coming in, so we're obviously not going to be able to get to all of them, but I'd like to go to a few on a different topic area. So a question is, was the workplace injury data, uh, I think presented by uh, Dr. Rooster, stratified by the indica versus sativa strains? You know, I can't answer that. Uh, I, I, I guess I would throw that back to the questioner, whether or not uh, the these are often based on THC blood level readings. And I don't know. I'm an economist. I don't know whether one can tell the difference uh, from, a, from a THC blood level in uh, these different strains. Okay, thanks, John. Um, so the next question, in the states that have an impairment level of cannabis at the time of a workplace injury, what is the level? So the... Um, the states vary. Um, many of them don't really have um, a measure. The measures are in terms of nanograms per milliliter, and they, they tend to be numbers like five nanograms per milliliter. I think it's easier to talk about uh, uh, intoxication while driving, and there are a couple of states that have um, DUI levels for uh, for. THC levels that are around five nanograms per milliliter. Um, the 
ACOM guidelines that I referenced before have a chart uh, that show uh, different thresholds around, say, if above five nanograms per milliliter, uh, impairment is, is pretty likely. Uh, very low levels like one, uh, unlikely. Um, but I've also been warned that the, that the research is changing on this. And so I did not put up that chart because it is six years old now. All right, folks. Well, unfortunately, we have uh, run out of time. Uh, we have a lot of questions uh, left here, but we'll, we'll do our best to answer those offline. And I wanted to, again, thank all the speakers uh, for pre presenting today on such a complex and evolving topic. And um, again, if, if, if you are interested in this presentation, we did record it and slides are actually available as well. And this will be available to those who, are, who have registered. So thanks again, everybody, and have a safe and healthy day.